Hi. So in today's lecture, I want to begin a discussion or continue a discussion of what to do for finding electric fields for continuous charge distributions. And we're going to do this for the electric field of a charged disk. So if you haven't already watched the lecture on electric fields for continuous charge, charge distributions where I introduced the concept and did the electric field for a ring, you'll want to go back and watch that one for the fundamentals before proceeding on with this charged disk lecture. Okay, so here's the uh, charged disk in question. All right, uh, we've got a circular disk. So it's a, a plane of charge in a circle, right? And the plane is in the uh, YZ plane. And we're going to consider our X axis to be um, sticking up out of uh, perpendicular to the plane of our disk, right? Um, pointing out perpendicular to that plane. So the disk is in the YZ plane and X is perpendicular to it. And the X axis runs through the center of our disk, okay? Now, um, the reason I want to make sure that you watch that lecture on the ring first is because I'm going to use some of the results of that to talk about how to do the disk. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider our disk to be a bunch of rings, okay? Now, our disk here, it has a radius big R, all right, as you can see in the figure, and it's got a uniform charge density here. Since it's a planar charge, right, this is a plane of charge, we're going to use sigma for our charge density expression. And sigma is the total charge, big Q, divided by the area of our, um, of our object here. And since this is a circle, the area is pi r squared, where big R is the radius of our ring. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Now, like I said, we're going to consider this disk to be a bunch of rings. So our little differential charge element here dq, we're going to assume that our d little q is our differential charge element and it's a little ring. And each one of those little rings has a radius that I'll call a, kind of to reference back to our lecture on the rings from earlier where the rings had a radius a, okay? And um, our ring is going to change sizes, so it's going to be a ring of very small radius and close to the x-axis, and then that radius is going to grow as we get near the radius of the disk. So our value of A is going to vary here from 0 to big R, where big R is the radius of our disk. Now, each one of those rings <clears throat> has an area. What you do is, of course, it's the thickness of the ring, <clears throat> and the thickness of the ring is going to be dA. As you can see here in the figure, dA is the thickness. And then basically, if you think about it, you slice through that ring, you would have a rectangle if you pulled it out straight. And the rectangle would have a, a thickness or width of dA, and it would have a length that's equal to the circumference of the circle made by the ring. And so dA here would be the length of our rectangle, 2 pi a, the circumference, times the thickness dA, little dA, right? So that's our differential area unit d big A, it's 2 pi little a times d little a. Now our dq is going to be our charge density, sigma, times our differential area unit, dA. So here it's sigma times 2 pi a dA. All right? Now also referencing back to our lecture on the electric field from a ring, our total electric field from this charge distribution is, as it's drawn, only going to have an x component. Any y or z components to our electric field that might be taken from, say, some spot would be canceled out. Any perpendicular components would be canceled out by the corresponding point on the opposite side of our disk. So any e perps here, any perpendicular components, right, would cancel out as we integrate over the whole disk, okay? So you can do that little argument with yourself. If you take a little differential element here at the top, you draw the electric field vector from there, it would be pointing, say, down and to the right. And then if you take the corresponding point on the opposite side of the disk, and you draw the electric field vector at the point P from that, it would be pointing up and to the right. So the down parts and the up parts, they would cancel each other out, right? They would be equal and opposite. And the only part that survives would be along the x-axis, all right? 
So we're only going to be considering the x components of the electric field here because those are the only components that don't cancel out. And then we're going to integrate those x components over the entire disk. Okay, so how would we do that? That's shown here. Our total x component of our electric field, which I've called here E sub x, right, is the integration of all of our differential dex components. The dex components are going to come from each one of these little rings, and we're going to vary the ring from starting at a radius of 0 all the way to a radius of big R. All right? So how do we do it? Well, we're going to say we're integrating the electric field, the magnitude of our electric field at, <clears throat> at the point P here would be kdq over r squared, so that's our magnitude. And we only want the x component, so we're going to multiply that times cosine of theta. Okay? Now, what I've got here in this drawing, um, a sketch, is an explanation of what our dq is and, of course, what r is and our cosine of theta. So as discussed on the previous slide, our dq is going to be the amount of charge in one of those little rings. And in one of those little rings, you would have the surface charge density sigma times the differential area element dA for that little ring, which ends up being sigma times 2 pi A dA. So that's our dq there, all right? R is the distance from the point in question to the point P. Now, you've got a segment on the ring here. You can see that R is the dashed line, okay? And R is the hypotenuse of a right triangle, right, whose legs are A and X, okay? And so R is equal to the square root of A squared plus X squared, or R squared is equal to X squared plus A squared. So I have that plugged in here, okay? Now, I can't just leave it like this, like I did for the ring, right, and say everything's constant except for the angle, because everything's not constant here, all right? As I go from my little rings near the center of the disk to my big rings outside of the disk, that changes my value of my radius, right? My radius A varies from 0 to big R. As my radius changes, so does my value of the hypotenuse of that triangle. It grows too, okay? It grows from x to um, the square root of x squared plus big R squared, right? It's going to grow. As my value of R changes, the cosine of theta is x over R, so as my value of R changes, so is my cosine of theta. So all of these things vary, right? Now, I don't want to integrate over all that stuff. I just want to integrate over, you know, one variable if I can help it. So what I need to do is express everything in terms of the same variables. So, like I said, I'm going to put r in terms of x and a, so that r squared is x squared plus a squared. Now I need to put cosine of theta also in terms of x and a, okay? So, if the cosine of theta is x over r, then that means that the cosine of theta is also x over the square root of x squared plus a squared, okay? Now I've done it. I've got everything in terms of um, all of my various, all of my variables that vary. I've got it in terms of x and a. So, plugging back into my expression, I'm going to take the integral, right? The electric field x component will be the integral of k times sigma times 2 pi a dA over x squared plus a squared times the cosine of theta, which is x over the square root of x squared plus a squared. So that's what I have to integrate, okay? That's what I have to integrate. Now, it looks like a big hot mess, but it's really not so bad. Okay, here's just a repetition of the integral that I have to do. Realize that x here is a constant. If I put my point P at some fixed point on the x-axis, then that means that the di distance from the center of the ring to my point P in question does not change. So x is a constant. That means I can pull x outside. I can also pull all of my other constants outside. Okay? So I have now the integral ex equals kx sigma 2 pi, my constants, times the integral of ADA over x squared plus a squared to the 3 halves power. Now the x squared plus a squared to the 3 halves power came from multiplying x squared plus a squared to the 1 power times 
x squared plus a squared to the one half power in that denominator. Okay, so that's where that came from. I just combined those terms. Everything else that you see on this top line here is either still inside the integral because it varies or it's been pulled outside because it's a constant. Now, what are the limits of my integration here? Okay, let's think about that for just a second. X is fixed. So the only thing that varies is the radius of my ring here, okay? And the radius of my ring is A. So A varies from zero to big R. And so that's what I've got here is the limits of my integration. So my integral part, the part that varies, is the integral from zero to big R, ADA over X squared plus A squared to the three halves. That's what I have to integrate, okay? Now, to do this integral, what we're going to do is we're going to do a substitution to make it a little simpler to look at. We're going to call our substituting variable, we're going to call it y, because why not? It doesn't matter. You can call it smiley face if you want to. I don't care. But I picked y. y is equal to x squared plus a squared. Okay? Note that I'm not saying this is the y coordinate. This is just a, a, a differential in, a substitution variable. I could have picked U, I could have picked Smiley, I could have picked a squiggle or a Greek letter. I just chose to call it Y here. So Y is X squared plus A squared. And then if I do DY, then DY would be 2ADA because X here is a constant. It doesn't vary. So the derivative of the constant is zero. All right, now I've got um, this bit. I'm going to just examine my integral. So I've got my integral right here and I'm gonna plug in what I'm substituting for, okay? So if I look at what I'm integrating, I'm integrating ADA over X squared plus A squared, A squared to the three halves power. Now Y is X squared plus A squared. So that means that in my denominator, I have Y to the three halves. The ADA is one half of my DY. So I've got this integral is equal to one half times the integral of DY over Y to the three halves. Now remember that when you have something in the denominator, that means it's a negative power. So I have one half integral of y to the minus three halves dy. Okay, what do I do to integrate this kind of expression? I increase my power by one, and then I figure out what constant out front would give me uh, what I have here when I differentiate, okay? So if I have y to the minus one half, then what I would do if I differentiated that was I would take this minus one half and bring it out front and multiply it. So to get that to all cancel out, I have to have a minus 2 out here, okay? So this is from your calculus 1, I think, okay? So I have 1 half times minus 2, y to the minus 1 half is the um, indefinite integral here. So that gives me the 2 in the denominator and the 2 on top cancel out. It gives me minus y to the 1 half for the result. Now I'm a little bit lazy, I admit it, when I come to this kind of thing. I just solve for my indefinite integral, and then rather than figuring out what the new limits of integration were, I hate doing that, I just plug back in for my substitution and use my old limits of integration. Okay, it is a little lazy, but it's what I do. Okay, so here, tomato, tomato in my opinion. So here are my e sub x. Um, I'm going to take that, I'm going to plug it back, to, back into my initial expression for my electric field. e sub x is equal to kx sigma times 2 pi, now times minus y to the 1 half, here y is x squared plus a squared, so that's minus x squared plus a, a squared to the minus 1 half, and now my limits of integration, right, for a, were 0 to r. All right, pause the video there for a second if you need to, to make sure that you completely understood everything that I said on this um, slide. Okay, assuming that you are following me so far, I'm repeating the expression that I had on the previous page, and now I'm simplifying the way that it looks a little bit, and I'm gonna plug in uh, my limits. So here I have e sub x is equal to minus kx sigma over two pi. Now x squared plus a squared to the minus one half power is one over the square root of x squared plus a squared, okay? So I've got that here, and I'm going to evaluate that from zero to big R. So, um, Plugging those limits of integration in, I would do the limit with respect to r minus the limit with respect to zero bit. So here I have e sub x is equal to minus kx sigma times 2 pi times 1 over the square root of x squared plus r squared minus the um, a is equal to zero limit, which is 1 over the square root of x squared. So basically that's it. I mean, I am done here. That's the answer. But I can simplify it and make it look a little nicer, right? 
For one thing, I have a minus sign out front here, and I also am subtracting two quantities. So when I do that, what I could do is distribute my minus sign inside this um, parenthesis. So I've got e sub x equals kx sigma times 2 pi times. Now, 1 over x squared, square root of 1, 1 over the square root of x squared is just 1 over x. So that's 1 over x minus 1 over the square root of x squared plus r squared. Okay, now I can make it look even a little simpler. Here I have a x out front and I have an x here in the denominator. I could write that so that that cancels out. Okay, so I'm going to take my x and bring it inside my parenthesis. So that leaves me with an electric field of k sigma times 2 pi times x over x is 1. So 1 minus x over the square root of x squared plus r squared. All right, so that is really the answer if you want to leave everything in terms of the Coulomb constant. But if I put things instead of in terms of the Coulomb constant, in terms of the permittivity of free space, epsilon naught, I could clean up some of these pi's here. So why not? So k, the Coulomb constant, is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, where epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space. Epsilon naught is 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 in SI units. So I could rewrite that. Instead of k, I've got sigma times 2 pi over 4 pi epsilon naught times the stuff in my brackets, right? And then I have a 2 pi up top and a 4 pi on the bottom, and that cancels out. So my final expression in terms of the permittivity of free space is the electric field in the x direction is sigma over 2 epsilon naught times 1 minus x over the square root of x squared plus r squared. That's it. That's my answer, okay? Remember that this electric field is assuming a positively charged disk here, okay, positively charged disk, a uniform distribution of charge, so it's the same surface charge density no matter where on the ring you are, okay, and it's along the axis, the x-axis, which runs through the center of the disk perpendicular here. So this would mean that my electric field would point in the positive x direction, okay, the total electric field would point in the positive x direction. Remember that any field components that are off x-axis would cancel out when I perform the whole integration. So I just have an electric field whose x component is this value for my final answer.